I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Central America. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the emotions we feel that when we're coming to a place like Nicaragua, but it could be a lot of different places, whether we're actually coming in person or whether we're just knowing about a place, and we get this feeling that we are going to be able to make a difference, we're going to be able to go and change things, and why that's great, and why it could be bad, and give an example that recently came up uh, that I think would be really great if you guys checked out. So we're going to get to that right after that bump. So what prompts today's video? One is I have very short time and had a lot going on today. And so the video is being done very quickly in my office. So I'm really rushing to get the show done today. Sorry, sometimes it happens. I've actually done an amazing job of getting a bunch of videos done for the future. I have a little bit of a gap and today is it, but all good stuff, nothing went wrong. Okay, so uh, I was watching this video sent to me um, from the channel Design Theory. They have an amazing channel that really digs into a lot of stuff, very educational and well done. And this particular episode is called Why Western Designs Fail in Developing Countries. And it's, uh, it's about a half hour long, well worth watching. We're going to pop up uh, a link for that so you guys can just go watch it. It'll also be in the show notes. I wanna make sure you guys get a chance to watch this if you can, because I found it very interesting. And they give some great examples of where Western designers, and in their case, they're digging into designers, right? Like engineers who are coming up, or kind of inventors, coming up with ways to improve life in the developing world uh, through Western invention and Western ingenuity. And of course, in general, we're going to assume that this is all coming from a great place, people who want to make a difference, they want to make things better. And it, 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 two things really come out of a lot of the examples that they give. So feel free to pause this and go watch that. Just make sure you come back and finish this. Give us a like and all that stuff. And if you have questions, comments, anything, get down there in the show notes and, and down below and just ask away. We get lots of great comments and, and feedback down there. I really appreciate you guys. And of course, there's information down there. Should you want to send in a video question and you can appear on the show, I would love to get you guys on the show as well. All that's down there. Please take a look. Okay, so one thing that happens here is in the examples, he really shows how easy it is for a well-meaning, well-intentioned Western attempt, Western, or, or they're talking about Western here, but the developed world with our context, trying to fix something in the developing world. And of course, this could also apply to things in the East, trying to fix things in the West and any number of like just places that have cultural contextual disconnects. Uh, and, and I find this really meaningful because we have so many conversations um, and with, with and, and, and we all have this feeling, right? I come from the United States myself, my background, and coming to Nicaragua where I live, uh, we have this really constant feeling of how can I fix things, right? We, we, how can I make a difference? And of course, that's absolutely the right feeling to have. You, you sense that there's something wrong. Um, in, in Nicaragua's case, the number one problem is a general lack of employment. That's the number one uh, crisis going on in the country. There, there just aren't enough jobs for everyone. How do I fix this? Right? And then we tend to try to come up with solutions. But, and this is a big problem, our context is not of the place that we're in or that we're thinking about. And so when I first got here, which was a long time ago, but it, it still happens, I get these feelings. Ooh, you know what I could do? And then there's some thing that I could do. And would it help? Quite often, no, right? I have to be really careful with those feelings because it is so easy to have those feelings and have some ridiculous thing come up as the example, right? And of course, uh, common examples are I'm going to donate something. I'm going to overpay for something. I'm going to uh, start a business doing something. And, and it's all things that are not organic. It's like, I'm going to fix things by doing whatever thing from the Western context. I'm going to buy some product and hand it out. I'm going to do, and, and it's so well-meaning and it's such a great place to want to make that difference and be willing to take action or spend money or whatever. But without having a chance to understand why things are the way they are, how they got there, 
what what people would actually want done, how to how it actually will impact them, will it actually do anything at all? These things can be very confusing and and very um, in in easily it can become counterproductive. You you want to make things better, you end up making things worse. And this design theory uh, video really does a great job of highlighting, especially with like the water system. Someone thought they were coming up with this cool way to improve water supplies in in arid communities and instead found a way to torture communities and, and potentially destroy them by taking away functional water sources, by taking, not using logic and not using common sense and not using contextual knowledge and not being able to put themselves in the place of the people who would be using it in any way and instead only thought of uh, something that seemed cool to a Westerner. And and in this case, you end up with a bit of, uh, uh, of course, um, potential bad design and potential harm, uh, which is what we saw in some of these cases with the water supply actually caused harm but the and, and in the case of the one laptop per child, it doesn't seem to really have caused harm. It's just an utter waste of time. In um, but the uh, the other problem is it's potentially and very easily defrauding volunteers. The people who are putting in the time, the people who are donating money, are essentially being defrauded. They're being told that this is a solution, but they're not necessarily being told. Oh, but we haven't actually checked with the people that it's going to help. This is, you know, we're just pushing this out uh, into another culture and, and trust us, we would like this, so why won't it work for them? Now this whole thing, so I definitely recommend watching that because I think you'll be kind of frustrated possibly more with some of these efforts when you learn how much warning they had, how clear it was that they were really just looking to defraud people. I think that the one laptop per child, and I have to say, the one laptop per, per child, I was defrauded by this person when I watched this and know what they said to us as donors, because I have a one laptop. It is in my storage unit. I still have a working one. Uh, when you see it in the video, be like, Sky has one of those. He's one of those people that that guy defrauded. He didn't just do a bad thing. He was a con artist. And I think it also really highlights why I tend to be very critical of universities. This guy is supposed to be a very prominent member of the MIT community. Is this the ethics that we would expect from MIT and what we would call an institution of higher learning? Is this their, I think is the MIT Media Center. I think this guy's the founder. This is the brilliant minds that are supposed to be founding and, and teaching our youth. This is exactly, even from a Western design standpoint, this guy's an idiot, right? Like complete and utter buffoon if he was not just going out to defraud people, right? Clearly the system didn't work. Clearly he was hiding that it didn't work. Clearly there was a bunch of design flaws, um, poorly thought through. I remember when it was new and we all thought, how is this going to work? This doesn't make sense. None of it makes sense. And that was really obvious, but it was a really cool bit of technology. So a lot of people got behind it and we were tricked into thinking it was trying to do something uh, for the third world. In reality, it was just an example of MIT and its media school and professors and just how easily they are willing to fall into a trap of defrauding the public. I'm very critical of universities because I think they should be held to a standard above normal society and we treat them as if they're somehow infallible and should be, you know, simply given the taxpayers money that people should have to bow down to them. We should respect them, but they don't earn that respect. And this is a great example of someone who's supposed to be very prominent and is a great example of just the general public can tell he's not very smart. Uh, so that, I think that's a really frustrating example and one that I was very involved in at the time that it happened. I was very young when it happened, uh, or it was quite some time ago. I was early in my career, uh, and the whole, you know, the technology that was going on was marvelous. But basically, they defrauded investors in order to raise money to funnel that money into private companies, right? So much like many universities do, they use the guise of being a public institution as simply a front for uh, taking money through inappropriate channels and moving it into private enterprises. Okay, so, but this is a really great example 
uh, tying into a book that I love and I really recommend for anyone who's going to find it because it's a travelogue, but it also covers some really important things about the developing world. And that is uh, Paul Thoreau's Dark Star Safari which is a tale of uh, Paul Thoreau, for those who don't know, is the author of books like The Mosquito Coast. He's a novelist, but he's also written a lot of travel logs and a few other things, I think. I think he was a journalist. Uh, but when he was young, he was, I believe, in the Peace Corps in Malawi. And uh, at some point when he was older, uh, he went back to Africa and did an overland trip from Cairo to Cape Town, which I've wanted to do myself ever since. I read this book quite a long time ago. And it's an absolute fantastic story of Africa about 20 years ago, covers a ton of Africa. I've always wanted to go to Malawi. I have a friend in Malawi that I really want to go see because of this book. Um, and, and Paul, in the book, goes back to Malawi, and he learns a lot about the work that they did through, I think, the Peace Corps, but through some volunteer nonprofit thing. And in doing so, he really came face to face with the fact that while well-meaning, their nonprofit enterprise had done incredible amounts of damage, including uh, not necessarily there in different places, propping up uh, regimes, um, hurting b small businesses. And they never thought about, for example, and, and a lot of people don't, that if you were to, and Americans say this all the time, oh, you have, you know, secondhand clothes, donate them somewhere. Of course, that's the right thing to do. But you have to be careful with those donations. Where are they going to go? How do you give out clothes for free without it causing a problem? Say, so how can give something away for free cause a problem? Well, let's say you go into a, uh, you know, a country where that's really valuable and you start giving away those clothes. Well, who are you giving them to? How are you determining who deserves them? And when you give them to someone, and food would do the same thing. We're going to go feed certain groups of people. Okay, but what happens to the people who had legitimate businesses, had invested their family savings, had put in time educating themselves on being farmers or running a restaurant, uh, providing a local food kitchen, maybe being a seamstress, maybe making clothes, right? And those people suddenly find themselves out of work and unable to feed their families, even though they were hardworking, industrious people who had taken a gamble, had it pay off, and then have someone from the outside come in and simply cut off their customers by giving them resources. Now, of course, the people they're giving it to are benefiting, and that's good, and we don't want to not benefit them, but we have to think about that generally when we're giving it out, there's damage to be happen to damage is going to happen as well, and who are we hurting in that process? Why would we hurt them to help these other people? And what makes these people worth helping and these people worth hurting? What kind of balance is that? Right? How do you decide that? And uh, I've seen this a lot um, here. There's a, there's a ton of stores that get products very cheaply or free from the United States, and they run large businesses out of them. And that's great, but what are donations in the original sense become business along the lines? And then it becomes that someone is rich and powerful, maybe not super rich, but someone is wealthy, affluent in the local market, and that gives them access to these free goods. And now they are becoming richer and richer because they will get the goods for free. And then they will sell them to those who are much poorer. And so the donation doesn't become a donation to the poor. It becomes a donation to the rich. And then it, the rich use it as a way to get richer. Now, we may be helping the overall ecosystem, maybe, but we also might be damaging it. And it's something you have to evaluate is there's more to it than you can't just donate a T-shirt and say someone who needs a T-shirt is going to get this and nothing else is going to happen in between. There are someone was going to sell them that shirt instead of you giving it to them. They've been hurt. Someone is going to be involved in getting them this shirt. Are they going to be a volunteer and put an effort? Are they going to be paying someone? Is there going to be import duties? Is there going to be, in some of the cases that uh, Paul talks about in the book, there were situations where uh, uh, warlords were getting uh, access to food supplies and other things that were coming in as donations and using it to prop up uh, uh, violent regimes because they were basically being funded by the donations, um, all kinds of things that, that have really negative connotations. In, uh, um, in the, some of the Pacific Island regions, there are what are known as container cults where people, because of donations and sometimes unintentional ones, but that makes it a little bit tougher to analyze, but donations that have come on container ships, they don't understand where the donations came from or what is behind them. And they have started what are known as cargo cults, where they actually 
worship the container ships and pray for ships to be shipwrecked or to come and deliver them things. And, and it's completely disrupted their society and become a defining characteristic of their society because someone shipped them large shipments of spam at some point, literal cans of meat. Like really weird things can happen and that can create a lot of problems. And so when you know, these are dramatic examples, right? But when you're looking at a place like Nicaragua, which has so many needs potentially, and we're presented Nicaragua as being a place that has needs, which may or may not be true in a lot of cases. Quite often, there is uh, uh, no easy means of understanding when something's actually a need, when we just perceive it as a need. Right? There's a lot of times where people are like, oh, you know what we need to fix in Nicaragua? And Nicaragua's like, why would I want to fix that? That's what I like. We chose that. Right Now, litter right? And, and loose dogs on the street. There's some things that everyone is like, yeah, we'd like to fix those things. Foreigners, locals, everybody would like to fix the litter. But some people perceive it as a major problem. Some people don't, right? And so, um, so that's the first thing is, is, are we trying to fix something that's actually a problem or just something that we don't personally like or wouldn't like if we were in that situation? We not even, may not even be there. But the other is we may, we may not perceive how things work and understand that things have been solved or that things are done really efficiently and we can't add to it because we don't have enough engineering knowledge, enough whatever, in order to do so. So I'll give an example of what I mean because this came up today, but trust me, this is just a random thing that came up today and I'm short on time. I talk to people nonstop about these things, right? Someone constantly comes up to me and says, hey, you know what we could do? You know what I should do? I'm going to do this in Nicaragua. And Living here for a few years, I can tell you that, one, it's super frustrating to hear these things. I love the place that everybody's coming from, right? It's a great place that your heart is at, but be aware. Everyone in Nicaragua hears this constantly from foreigners. Oh, we're going to come fix this thing. And then whatever they propose is clearly not thought through. And that's very frustrating. I've only lived here uh, on and off for nine years, right? And for me, there's, I have to stop myself because I want to do the same thing and I have not been here enough. I don't have the context to understand when things are going to make sense and when, when people have thought it through and when they haven't, right? And, and if I'm feeling that, I can't even imagine how often the Nicaraguans hear it and feel it because there's so many things that I don't catch that people are saying like that, that they're like, what? Of course we thought of that thing. We tried that thing. That thing failed 30 years ago. We stopped because it didn't make sense, right? And so there's just a lot of this. So the example today was someone having just noticed that I had a high efficiency air conditioner in the office, uh, which, so the thing that they do here in Nicaragua is we use split units, ductless split units. They're much more efficient, they're very cost effective, and you can put them only where you need them. And so everybody in Nicaragua uses them because we don't have as much electricity, we have to be super efficient, there's all these things. Now, there's things we don't get right in Nicaragua, there's things that we could improve, I'm not saying we can't, but someone deciding that I didn't know how to use air conditioning, uh, that I could improve dramatically things in Nicaragua by sealing the house. So th there's a ton of things that are wrong with this. The first is, I don't own this house. I don't have the right to seal it. I can't do that. So that's a nonsensical suggestion in a kind of, like, I understand, hey, did you know, have you heard of, in, of insulation? But let's be honest, it's really insulting to suggest that I don't know what insulation is or that I don't know about sealing a house. Obviously, I know those things. Like, what kind of in, it, it, advice is that to give to someone? You Even if you're talking to Nicaraguans, like, are you actually suggesting that they don't know what insulation is? Of course they know that those things exist. They know the concept. They're making decisions based on what's affordable, what's going to work, what's possible, and so forth, right? That's the first thing. Second thing, right, being surprised that there's split units. Why would you be surprised? The entire world pretty much uses split units. I've lived in a lot of countries. They're all using split units. It's a very North American thing to expect something else because we use very low efficiency cooling in North America for reasons that are mostly cultural, right? But there's, you know, some people use split units, but because people do whole house cooling and because people, we talk about this a lot on the show, right? People live inside the house instead of outside the house. You have different needs. So it, it makes sense in some cases, but it's a very different animal. 
Okay, so that's the first thing. I don't have the right to change it. Why would you recommend to me as a renter that I completely redesign a house that I don't have? Like, that's a that's a leap that doesn't make any sense for someone to make just because they knew I had a high efficiency air conditioner. It's not like they saw something that they could identify as a problem, right? Like having a floor standing unit with no vent and like clearly there's a problem. Oh, you know what? I can see a thing you can improve. This might make things better for you right? They can't see that there's a thing that I can improve and they don't know that I can improve it, right? So it's a weird place to give a recommendation from. And I'm just going on this. This is a little thing, but this is what Nicaraguans are exposed to nonstop when talking to foreigners, this continuous stream of what essentially is a cultural international version of mansplaining, right? Like, um, yes, I know how to seal a house, but I don't own this house. And why do you think it's not sealed to some degree? Okay, there is a little bit that I could seal. That's one of the reasons that we put up curtains. Curtains help insulate, right? Now, it also looks better, but it helps insulate as well. These are things to think about. But I can't go replace the windows. They're not my windows. I can't go replace the door. It's not my door. I can't insulate the walls. They're solid concrete. Of course, you don't need to insulate solid concrete, but you get the point. Second thing, she said you should seal the entire house. Well, I don't know how you would do that. I'd have to put on a roof because the middle of the house is open. It's not exactly wide open. It doesn't rain in, but there, it's wide open for all intents and purposes. There has to be screening because animals could just come in otherwise. So the middle of the house is wide open. It's not possible to seal it. It would be a different house. And we don't close up the house. Those who have seen my house or, or know it's nighttime now, I'm not going to show it. We leave it wide open during the day, right? Front door open, back door open, side doors open, windows wide open. The thing it's, it's the outdoors. The fact that there's a roof over it so it doesn't rain on us keeps us dry, but you're outdoors. When I leave my office, I'm outside. And like all the bathrooms, wide open to the outside, which is nice. All the air flows through the whole house stays cool. So we have seven air conditioners. They're isolated in separate rooms. And her response was, well, if you sealed up the house, maybe you wouldn't need to run all seven air conditioners. You could save efficiency. But that doesn't make any sense, right? Because if we sealed up the house, then the amount of space that we would be air conditioning would go from maybe, uh, I'm just estimating numbers here, but move from 800 square feet to 4,000 square feet. It'd probably be much larger, right? It's uh, the amount of the house that we don't air condition at all, has no air conditioners, is probably in excess of 4,000 square feet on its own. And then the parts that we do air condition are relatively small. My office is not that big. It has an air conditioner. I have a matching room over here that we use for video games. It has an air conditioner. We have seven rooms that we bother air conditioning. We have some rooms we don't air condition at all, has no option to. And so we only air condition, like all Nicaraguans do, rooms that we are currently using. So we don't need all seven because of capacity. We need seven because we're being super efficient. If we were to follow the recommendations that were given, if we ignored the fact that the house is sealed where it makes sense, if we ignore the fact that you can't seal the entire house, if you ignore the fact that uh, I rent and don't own, so I don't have that option. If you ignore the fact that it's a pre-built structure and I don't even know what it would mean to seal the house, like it, basically tear down the house and build a different house, even if we did all those things, if we were to do the thing, we would triple, quadruple, quintuple the total amount of space that would we would need to air condition in one sense. We would also need to air condition all of it all the time, which is not what we do. In reality, what we do is normally run two or three air conditioners max on any given day, and that's it. There's whole rooms that, that don't get air conditioned, sometimes for weeks at a time. Uh, generally not quite that much, but it can go quite a bit. Now, my children's bedrooms, they air condition most of the time, but not always. My one daughter only runs her air conditioner once in a while, the other one runs it quite a bit. My bedroom can go a day or two without air conditioning, but generally gets air conditioned. Uh, my office only gets air conditioned now because of the amount of dust. And that's, so that's why it's air conditioned, not because of the temperature. And right now, I don't even think the air conditioning's on now that I think about it. But so we, I, we only air condition these really tiny spaces and they get air conditioned if someone needs to be cold. Like my wife likes it much colder than the rest of us do. She keeps her space colder. Other spaces like my office, much warmer by like six degrees. We wouldn't have that control if we did the entire house. It would just be one big thing. All the air conditioners would be running wide open all the time. We would have to use easily 10 times, 1,000% the power 
and not get anywhere near as good of air conditioning. We wouldn't be as cool. We'd have a bunch of spaces that would be cool that aren't now. We don't need them to be cool. Why would I need the middle of the living room that we just walked through to be cool? We don't need that. There's no reason to do that. So this thing that feels like this really simple thing that's, one, extremely condescending, so I'm sorry, but it really is, right, to say you don't know anything about air conditioning, you don't know anything about houses, and just from seeing that you have a high-efficiency air conditioner, we're going to suggest that you westernize all this stuff. And you don't think about, one, any of the context that you need to make that kind of suggestion. This is, so coming as a business consultant, right, one of the things that drives me crazy is, People will bring in vendors and they give all these suggestions. And, and I've had CEOs turn to me and say, so what's wrong with this suggestion? And I say, well, first of all, they don't know anything about your business. How was that a suggestion? That was a sales pitch. They never asked you what you needed. They never evaluated your needs. So every word that they said was based on made up information. They knew they were lying because they knew they hadn't asked what was necessary to even start this conversation. The CEO is like, yep. Get out of here, people, right? I've seen people fired on the spot because they never asked what was needed. This is a recommendation that was given with no thought to what reality was, no con context, no thinking about what is a house built like, right? And so this is a thing that happens a lot, is that people say, oh, you know, it'd be great. You should do this in Nicaragua. And they aren't aware how streets or drains or water pressure or electrical supply or, you know, uh, I see a ton of people telling me to do certain things with my electrical they don't realize that we're not grounded. And so those recommendations don't necessarily make sense. And in some cases are dangerous. Mostly the recommendations are fine, just not as effective as they think they are because we're not grounded. But that we're not grounded electrical, that the entire system isn't grounded, isn't something that people are very familiar with. And then they say, well, why don't you ground it? Because I don't own the house. I don't own the electrical system. None of this is my domain, right? Why does an entire country work this way? Because it works, right? <laughs> like, why, why, what, why is the, what's the complaint? What are you trying to fix? The air conditioning that we have here is dramatically more efficient than the air conditioning I came from in the United States. I've never lived in a place until I got to Nicaragua that was as efficient as here. We have big concrete walls, high efficiency air conditioners, 220 circuits everywhere, and we really tiny spaces that we air condition only when we need it. And they can cool the space down in minutes. Everything's tiled to stay cool. And, and we live much warmer temperatures than people do other places, even after our air conditioning. We've already solved these problems and are doing it far more efficiently than they do in North America on average. And not because we're smarter, not because Nicaragua's got it all figured out, but for two key reasons. One, Nicaragua is dealing with Nicaragua, and so they deal with the problems that they have, just like North America deals with the problems that they have. And two, one of the problems that North America doesn't have is a lack of electrical infrastructure in most cases, and most of Central America, most of the world, has a limited power supply. We're fine here in Nicaragua, but 10 years ago, we were not. I remember living here when we weren't, and being able to run air conditioners to keep the place cool wasn't something you could do. They couldn't handle it, so you had to be really, really careful running air conditioners. Now there's plenty of electric. You can just run them all wild all the time. doesn't matter from a grid perspective, right? And we're all green power, so conserving the grid doesn't actually help anybody, right? We're just pulling air power and hydroelectric power and volcano power. Yeah, it, if we didn't use so much, we could resell more, I guess, but we're not using up power that we're burning fossil fuels for or whatever, in most cases anyway. So uh, when you do all that and you say, oh, these are different problems. In North America, people are running inefficient sub, uh, systems where you can cool the entire house with a central air conditioning unit. And because they're being so inefficient, they can seal the entire house and cool it as one unit because they can just throw power at it. And in Nicaragua, we're historically not able to throw power at it. Currently we are, but historically we're not. So we have a much more efficient design because we have to. That's a problem we had to solve, but we did solve it. And so approaching it from a, if you did things completely wrong from this perspective, like a North American, well, this is how a North American would fix that thing. Well, okay, but we didn't make that mistake, so we don't need to fix it. And that lack of context and that lack of wanting to have context, not asking, is this a problem to be solved? That's the first thing. So many times when people say they're going to solve something, it's not even a problem. So there's nothing to solve, right? So it's a, it's a very different thing. And so... Uh, I don't want people to not have these reactions. I want you to say, ooh, can I make things better? That, that's a great, to want to make the world a better place is a fantastic thing. But don't assume that just because 
one, your context is what it is that everyone else's context is going to be the same. That's a bad way to go. But also, and this is where it gets a little bit problematic, there's a very strong tendency for North Americans and Western Europeans to see the rest of the world much like children and treat them that way and approach it as a we're wise and we're experienced and we have everything figured out and we're going to show you how to move in our direction. And most of the rest of the world has very much the opposite opinion that the West is not a very happy place to live. It is expensive. It has all kinds of problems. And we don't want those problems brought here. And we don't want the mindset of this area is wise. This area should do what it's told. And we're going to tell you how to do things. Right? It's not It's not a good relationship between the regions. And as a North American who lives here, I have to constantly curtail this emotional feeling that I get. It's something that we were brought up with culturally, right? We were taught that we did things well and other people did things poorly. And that is not generally true. There are some things that North Americans do extremely well. But in most cases, when they do them extremely well, they're doing them well in the context of living in North America. And what even the things that we do extremely well may not translate to other contexts or may need some effort to translate to other contexts. And so that's something you have to just be aware of when interacting with other cultures, when interacting with other parts of the world, to remember that they have a whole bunch of information that you don't have. And if they haven't solved it, to assume, and this, this also applies to business in a much less offensive way, but many business people look at Nicaragua and immediately say, oh, I just imagine they have this problem, I'm going to solve it. And that's one of the things we constantly talk about with business. Do you really think there aren't enough bars in Nicaragua? There's so many bars. If you open one, you're competing against existing bars. You're never going to find a spot that doesn't have one. Well, maybe they need restaurants. No, trust me, they have plenty of restaurants. Oh, they must need hotels. No, everything you're mentioning is the thing that every single foreigner thinks is a thing they're going to solve. And every single Nicaraguan is like, but we have too many of these as there already is. Why would you open another one? That doesn't make any sense. We're closing the ones we have because we have too many. And they never stop and think. Most people, right, don't stop and think. Are there enough? Is this something that no one thought of opening another one? Of course they did, right? The Nicaraguans thought of it. All the expats that are already here have thought of it. Every expat that's thinking of coming here has thought of it. And for some reason, we think it's a new and novel thing that we are going to be the first with this business idea that is so overdone that it's incredibly difficult to compete in that space. And the same thing with so many recommendations. We all think, oh, I've come up with this great solution to Nicaragua. Of course, the Nicaraguans who live with it every day have thought through nearly all possible solutions. And all the expats who are here have also done that. And all those ideas are exhausted. They've been discussed. They've been discounted. They weren't actioned for whatever reason. Hearing it over and over again, how somebody who hasn't been here doesn't learn the context is just going to magically swoop in and, and correct us all uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't tend to be a way to have a good relationship with a potential new country. So if you're looking at moving to Nicaragua or something like that, absolutely, you want to be, how can I help the country? But remember, you're the child in this case. You're the one who doesn't know how everything works. You don't know what is needed. You don't know what has already been solved. You don't know what has already been tried. Assume that you're just missing things. Look to listen instead of speak, learn instead of teach, and get to know the environment there's every potential that you have some experience or knowledge that could be useful here, that maybe there's just not enough people who have that knowledge and that you could help teach more people. Absolutely. As a North American, I bring some important context that there are things that I have learned that I can be beneficial with in a teaching or guiding capacity. Most of them are around business, mostly around how to interact with North American business. The one thing that we do have a special, you know, uh, niche with is I can teach Nicaraguans how North Americans perceive certain interactions or the way we say things or something. But the thing that I'm teaching them about is my cultural context, not teaching them something about their universe, only helping them do the same thing in reverse that I'm saying we need to do with them. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. Get down those comments. Let me know what you think, ideas, comments, questions, all that, and I will see all of you.
tomorrow.